now and the meeting stays up. But mm -hmm. all right. Well, I am going to now that we're all techie and that part is done. I'm going to turn it over to Robert and thank you very much, Robert. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks very much to uh, to Gloria for having me, and thank you all for for having me here today. Um, as she's uh, Gloria had said, I'd finished the, or as we talked about just a moment ago, I'd finished the PhD in English and Visual Studies at Penn State this past August. Um, right now, I'm teaching first year writing in Asian American literature, which uh, just as is probably going to be the case for all my literature courses. There's a heavy science fiction or SF focus there. Um, and then this fall, I'm going to start working uh, at Lycoming College as an assistant professor of English. So it's a small liberal arts college, um, not far from here. So fortunately, won't have to uproot my family and, and take them across the country or something like that. Um, so to start, I thought I'd just share uh, a bit of uh, my history with science fiction since we're in a science fiction friendly group here. Um, my, uh, as a child of the 1990s, I very much grew up on large science fiction franchises like Star Trek and Star Wars. Um, and then in grad school, initially, I didn't talk very much about my science fiction interests because um, I had assumed that postmodern or serious literature would be more important or more valued. Um, and I was fortunate to, to find that this was not the case. And I was in a department that was very friendly for me to explore these interests. Um, so you know, more recently, my interest in SF has gotten, I, I think, healthily a lot broader. And frequently in my literature classes, SF, science fiction, magical realism, and other genres all line up right next to each other. So Charles Hughes' How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe is in the same class this semester as George Takei's memoir of his, his family's time in internment camps. Um, and, and for me, that's because uh, I think of, certainly I think of SF as, as a genre, but more than that, I just feel that sometimes or very frequently there are stories uh, in our culture and in parts of our history that are really best told through fantastical environments, fantastical characters and science fictional worlds. Um, and in, then in ways that are sometimes even more real or more resonant than it would be if we were just showing the things that are happening you know, outside our door day to day. Um, for my own narrowest uh, research area, um, I'm interested in depictions of of the technology companies and what they say about the historical moment that we're in. Um, and then my even within there, I'm especially interested in imagined technological systems and how they work. Um, a, an article that I was greatly influenced by a number of years ago uh, was by a, a science and technology studies scholar, Langdon Winner, and he wrote an essay called Do Artifacts Have Politics or Do Technologies Have Politics? And his answer is, in short, that they do, in that the very design of a thing um, is made possible by certain conditions and arrangements of power. So in one of his books, I think it's called The Whale and the Reactor, he's talking about how it is that a nuclear reactor is built, where it is on, say, I think like the coast of California somewhere. What are the laws and the regulations and uh, relationships between corporations and the government that make that possible? And even in our own world, I think in, in very concrete, very day-to-day -day ways, we can think about how, for instance, um, iPhones and iPads exist and what the material conditions, the political arrangements, the business practices, and the geopolitical um, situations are that enable them to exist and make them cost what they do for us to be able to buy them for you know, three, what, 300, $800. Um, so as an example of the sort of thing that my dissertation project works on and the sort of ways that I think about these things, um, one example that I often think about is the science fiction novel that's since been made into a film, Ready Player One. The novel was originally written by Ernest Klein. Um, and the premise of that is that um, in this sort of near future world, the primary use of the internet is for people to access the Oasis, which is this virtual world, this simulation. It's free um, and it's entirely owned and operated by this benevolent sort of uber nerd, James Halliday, and, and eventually he right. dies. Um, and uh, there's a contest for who's going to control that company. Um, 
there's on the one hand an evil internet service provider because the mm -hmm. corporation's always evil. And then on the other hand, there's this scrappy upstart Wade who wants to uh, win it all. Um, and I think in that sort of example, it, it's a very entertaining book. It's for, again, for me at the age that I am, having grown up with a lot of the properties that are referenced in it nostalgically, it's fun. Um, but what's under examined in that sort of work is I think of, you know, what's sure, you know, there's this battle to who's going to solely control this company that basically runs the whole internet. Um, but what's under examined there is at this very premise itself that this platform, this virtual world, the Oasis, as great as it is, basically takes over the internet. That's the way that people communicate, talk to one another, learn about things, go to school, this single, you know, private company. Um, and so even though the fate of the world hangs on who wins the contest and who gains control, the hero Wade or the internet service provider company, you're going to be living under a despot no matter what. It's just a matter of whether it's a despot of your choosing. Uh, and is that really the sort of world that we would want to envision for our future? So I take a, a similar approach to, um, to some depictions of slightly more near future depictions of tech companies and ones that are um, a little bit closer to the um, world that we live in. Um, and usually in these cases, uh, there is some overt critique that they're making about the industry or the technology and our relationship to it. Um, but usually what I'm trying to look for in there, sort of like poking and, and prodding at the details, is to get a sense of what else is there, what else is assumed within the world building that they've made. And the two examples that I'll talk about today are the limited Hulu series Devs by Alex Garland that came out in early 2020, and then the film The Circle by James Ponsalt, which is adapted from a novel by David Daggers that, uh, that came out a few years ago. Um, so to begin to, to talk about Devs, this is definitely one where there's a, there's a high, hard science fictional premise back there um, in that one, the setting of the series is um, primarily in this giant tech company, Amaya, that has made quantum computing work for commercial applications. If you're familiar with quantum computing, I think, and I'm, um, I'm not sure exactly where the to, the, to the day research on this is, but quantum computers exist and they function, um, but that's still in, in ways that aren't yet completely productized into running computer software that consumers use today in the same way that Google um, or Apple creates services that we use as consumers. In the science fictional world of devs, um, the company Amaya has has made that happen. So by virtue of using quantum computers, they've really demolished all competition across other tech companies. And then within the company, there's also a secret project to um, simulate the entire universe within an extremely powerful computer. And the one that's pictured in this slide is the, the one that uh, runs it. And that following a sort of a deterministic model of the universe where um, the premise is that you could, in theory, compute the entire universe. Um, and then because everything happens um, in a predetermined relationship with what came before, you can take that simulation and you could advance it forward and see what happens in the future or rewind it backwards and see what must have happened in the past. Um, the part that I'm, uh, I've spent a little bit of time thinking about is what does the world look like when you take all of the effects that we associate with large tech companies today and really think about them as being caused by a single large company? Um, and it's almost just a little a thought experiment that, that I had of thinking about, um, at least in the way that the film, the series depicts it, what's this like, for instance, for the city of San Francisco? Um, so, the series does depict this tech company in as I think as a realistic way as you can imagine, and that includes some of the things that do exist in our real world. So, if you've been to San Francisco or if you're familiar with the the tech company scene around there, there's a constant stream, a daily stream of shuttle buses that run from popular urban centers in San Francisco where young professionals might live, and then out to these large tech company campuses like the Googles or the Apples or things like that. Um, and that's depicted in the film um, here. And then also um, there's a tremendous um, income disparity in San Francisco. There's a tremendous unhoused population there. And that's depicted a bit in the series here with this 
unhoused person on the doorstep of the main characters. Although arguably um, what's shown here doesn't come close to the scale that this is an issue in um, San Francisco today. Um, but if you take the premise of the series forward a bit, you know, whereas in the world today, this is because of the large tech companies as well as the smaller ones that are all clustered in San Francisco and in the Silicon Valley and in the Bay Area. But in the premise of this film, really all of that has been sucked up into a single company that has caused these large, um, or at least has had a large influence in these social uh, challenges and problems. So I argue when I look at this film, because I look at the films both in terms of the narrative content as well as just, you know, what do they look like on screen? Um, that this is represented visually in a number of ways. So for one, there's a cinematographic choice here in that that sort of orange yellow light that fills the chamber where their supercomputer exists. Um, that look is replicated in different scenes of the film. On the one hand, you know, on the far upper left here, this is a scene that's within the computer simulation. But in the middle, this is just the protagonist within her department or apartment. And then on the lower left, she's um, forced to go to a meeting with a psychiatrist and there's a similar orange light here. And so there's the sense that in the same way that the technology company's influence has um, suffused its way throughout the city and its infrastructure, I think that's visually represented with the coloring of the light that appears in these different spaces. Um, and then similarly, that ominous sense is also reflected on screen through, and I, this isn't evident here because this is a stilled image, um, but these drone-like or helicopter-like shots of San Francisco and the different locations in the film that uh, are clearly of, of a height above and slowly moving forward, almost like if you have an Apple TV, the sort of city view screensaver images that come up there. And it creates this creepy sensation of surveillance within the series. And then finally, it's, it's almost sort of a funny bit. There's this creepy giant statue that is part of the tech company's campus. And here, this is a UC campus um, that they've used as the, uh, the backdrop for the tech company. Um, and the image itself, if you're familiar with the notion of the uncanny valley, there's this idea that when you, uh, particularly in early computer animation, things get creepy looking when they look human-like, but it's still clear that they're not quite human. And I think that that is the sort of sense attached with the look of, uh, of this statue that's the company's namesake. The protagonist played by Nick Offerman uh, named the company after his daughter who, who had tragically passed away. And so it's this giant, strange statue that um, that is such a part of that world of the daily life of the people within the universe of this series um, that it's really never commented on how strange or unusual or creepy it is. So the things that I think about with this series are, um, one, what is life like if a single company were to, to dominate all of the technology industry? Um, and in that case, in the in the series, that's due to quantum computing. It's this new thing that comes in and then all of a sudden changes all of these consumer technologies. Um, and even though I originally worked on this, this part of my research project a few years ago, since that time, with the advent of generative AI being um, put productized and really pushed through so many services, that's, that's something that I think it was like a very clear analog. Here's a new technology and companies are trying to figure out how can we maximize this or, or squeeze out everyone else? Um, secondly, I think of, of what are the consequences of the, uh, of a, or the, what are the impacts of a tech industry on uh, a single city, even in, the, in this case, San Francisco, when all of the industry has been subsumed into a single one. Um, and finally, in a larger sense, what are the strange conditions of life that we might in the future or might already be grown accustomed to like that giant creepy statue that we are inattentive to simply because they've been so deeply ingrained in, in our everyday life. The other film or the other work that I'd like to talk to a bit that I've studied in a similar vein is The Circle, um, which is again based on that novel by David Eggers. Here's just a, this is Tom Hanks plays this CEO character and he's demoing a, a little video camera on stage here. Um, the basic plot of the film and the novel are similar in that um, there's a large tech company, The Circle, um, and similarly enough, and maybe this is for narrative purposes, but like with the devs film, this single company has consumed or destroyed all its competitors. Um, and the concern of this 
film is really around privacy and the erosion of privacy or the loss of privacy. So this company uses the language of sharing to convince people to um, essentially turn over or post or share all of their information. And there's a lot of language that we're probably used to in our own everyday lives about transparency, about sharing being good, about secrets being bad. Um, and in the character, Tom Hanks, uh, the character Eamon Bailey played by Tom Hanks, he, he has this line where he says, knowing is good, knowing everything is better. Um, and I think for this film, you know, this is a really good case in casting because the the character Eamon Bailey, like some of the best villains, you know, the villain doesn't think of themselves as doing something evil. They think about themselves as doing something good, something essential. So what better person to cast than America's Tom Hanks in this sort of role? Um, the movie, the movie's protagonist, May, is played by Emma Watson, a new employee. Another example of great casting where there's this character who sort of ends up going down a sort of dark path, but played by a character that we've known, uh, an actor that we've known for years playing Hermione in Harry Potter. Um, and she rises through the ranks, becomes a social media star, essentially live streaming her life. Um, and then ultimately towards the end of the film, it's revealed that there's a plot to complete the circle, to know everything and essentially destroy privacy as we know it for this company to hold all of the world's information. Um, and my argument about this film, turning from the what the film is about to how I look at it visually on screen, um, is that the film, in a way, puts us through a number of different viewing positions as an audience member as we go through it. So we're simultaneously the audience in the theater or at home watching this movie. Um, but it also positions us sometimes as if we're living within that world, whether that's as a tech enthusiast fan or as somebody who's as a user of social media. So for one example, um, the scene where this shot comes from is early in the film when Hanks's character is unveiling a new product. Um, and it looks something like this. Um, and over here, so I've purposefully sort of juxtaposed some real and some fictional things together. On the upper right is uh, Hanks's character on stage in front of a giant screen. On the lower left uh, are some of the lead characters in the film and the audience. On the upper left, there's an executive from an Apple tech event in 2016, the same year that this film came out. And in the lower right, there's the shot of the like clapping audience in the Moscone Center or wherever it was. Um, and you know, on the one hand, the, the similarity between these things is very purposeful. They want to emulate something that feels you know, real in, uh, to us. Um, on the other hand, the reason why it's so easy for them to emulate that is because increasingly, um, product unveilings from tech companies have started to look increasingly like cinematic productions in the in the way that we see movies. So if you were to go back and look at the premiere of the first iPod, it probably looks a good bit different from, from this. Um, we have these switching between the close-ups of the person on the stage, the wide shot where we see the screen behind them, the shots of the audience, close-up shots of the product. And that visual language is very much replicated here in the film. Um, and it Think looking at this film again made me think of among the weird things that you know people might have done to get by during peak COVID quarantine. I remember there was one morning where my wife and I simply like watched probably like an hour or two hours worth of tech keynotes like this. Um, as people who are, you know, even though I'm I critique technology and I'm an enthusiast of it and consumer at the same time, and we'd just be looking at it and thinking, like, oh, that's so neat, or like just the staging of that was so impressive or clever or funny. Um, and I feel like in this way, the film sort of puts us in that very same position. You could watch a few seconds of that film. You could watch a few seconds of a product unveiling. And it's like you're in the same position of a fan watching the unveiling of a new product. The second piece of visual language in the film that I look at um, is this scene where uh, May is at work. She's training to be a customer service, uh, um, customer service representative. Um, and if you're familiar with internet companies, you know, in a way... Um, really, the customer of Google isn't really us, the people who use Google Calendar or Gmail. It's the companies that advertise for them. So here she's doing customer service, helping advertisers, um, and she's training on that. Um, and in here, in the graphics that the film uses, we see some visual language that's similar to, that's become very popular in film uh, since um, texting has become so prevalent. Um, this notion of, you know, you see the the little speech bubbles pop up of the characters having their exchange. Um, but if you think about it a bit, 
it's almost like we're being put into two different viewing positions at the same time. On the one hand, we're in the traditional view uh, of the theater goer that we see Emma Watson sitting on her computer. But on the one hand, on the other hand, it's almost as if we are seeing the screen interface that she has. And so it's almost as if we're being positioned within her seat, you know, looking at her screen. The other view that I put here, there's this sort of it looks like a hologram. We see some of what is her screen and the filmmakers have cleverly made that look as if it's hovering above her uh, her workspace. Now, this isn't supposed, this isn't as if it exists in the diegetic world of the film. It's not like there are holograms in this office, but it's sort of a clever trick so that the audience can see important information that's relevant to the scene um, while we're also able to see her, uh, her at work. And so I think in both of these cases, there's something akin to what the experience is of actually being a social media user today, in that we're both the writer, the creator of information or the publisher of posts, but also the observer at the same time watching in on the things that other persons have made. And the final example I'll just look at briefly here is um, within this film, there's a social media platform called Zing. That's pretty much like X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, and this is how the filmmakers have visualized it here. And she is a very popular social media personality in this film. So there's the cloud of these, um, as well as many more around, and they sort of appear and disappear um, in depth in the frame, like coming forwards and then vanishing. And they're within a few seconds, there are a, a number that appear on screen. Um, and the in an interview, the director talked about how, while they were designing this graphic, they were trying to figure out how to um, Put them on screen uh, so that you get a sense of of what she's seeing, but not so much as to antagonize the viewer. And so they had this constant back and forth of how much is too much. Um, but what I argue is that in a way, the antagonizing is the point. The sense of constant barrage of messaging that appears on screen here is in a way a visualization to us of what is actually happening and what it, at least to me, it affectively feels like to be within uh, uh, to be work within the world of social media, where there's a constant stream of material coming at you all the time. And then on the other side of it, behind the screen, or if you want to think of it as across the world on a computer server somewhere, this in a way represents something close to what's actually happening. Because even though we might scroll through on our phones or on our computers, uh, what looks like a very linear sequence of posts that we can read and manage what is happening behind the scenes is an overwhelming volume of hundreds or thousands of messages or content that we could possibly be shown at any given second that is algorithmically just whittled down to these things that we can see within the linear process of scrolling down the screen. And so in that sense, the very effort to try to visualize on screen and, and communicate information to the audience mediates a bit of really what the actual experience is, is of being a person living within social media um, and living in the world as it is today. Um, so in closing, these are just two examples of the sort of work that I'm doing and that I'm interested in. Um, and I, my core takeaway that I'd want to express here is that I think that even in the least fantastical film uh, depicting the tech in industry, or the ones, you know, even if some, you know, some of these take some hard science fictional present premise to an extreme, but nonetheless, even on, on the more boring stuff, um, those representations are usually doing something. Um, and I think that by closely examining cinematography, user interfaces, and imagined technologies, we can get a clear sense of what the basic low-level assumptions that films and TV series are making about the significance of large tech companies and the ways that those might come to dominate even the most mundane aspects of our everyday lives. Thanks very much for having me today, and, and I'm happy to talk and uh, feel any questions that you might have about this. Oh, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Robert. And I'm sure we'll have a number of questions because before you started talking, we were exploring the uh, embrace between these high tech companies and the military and, and how, you know, it's very difficult to reach some of these people with the kinds of uh, thinking that's going on in the film Oppenheimer for instance, if they live in an encapsulated campus and, and discourse community. So uh, that also was something that we were talking before the meeting started. Okay, so mm -hmm. we're opening it up now to your questions. What do you have <laughs> as questions? Any questions? Yeah. 
Alice, it looks like Alice has a question. Yeah, hi, thank you for your presentation. And I'd just like to know, is, is the um, way that big tech companies are being portrayed in film, because I haven't seen many of these films, is it moving more and more toward a negative portrayal uh, and, and that it used to be more positive and now it's becoming more and more negative or has it always been negative? I don't have a real clear sense of that because sure. I haven't seen a lot of these films. I, I think that it's become more critical over time in that um, uh, when I think of, I think particularly some some books that are considered like Silicon Valley books uh, from like the 90s or so, they I felt like they captured more of a sort of sense of like you, this sort of startup company with the ping pong table and this crazy zany work culture. Um, and that was even captured a little bit more recently. And uh, there's a very mediocre comedy film called The Internship with Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson about them getting like an internship at Google. And there's that very similar sense. Um, the These films uh, that I've talked about are certainly more critical. And I think there might've even been more negative portrayals since. There's uh, um, a series called, I think, Super Pumped, where Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays an Uber executive. Um, and there was a film I recently saw advertised called The Consultant, starring Christoph Waltz at a tech company. And I think that in the same way that I think since 2016, scrutiny of tech companies on both sides of the political spectrum has increased, I think that's reflected in media a bit more and more. Um, as I've gone through the dissertation process, the funny thing is that I've I realized how like, um, as you like study something really specific, um, over time, uh, you know, I thought of these as contemporary works, but, you know, we're getting further and further away from them as as time goes on. And so I, I think at least for the next few years, my focus will still be on the stuff of the 2010s. But I'm also aware of it. There are probably more things coming out that I'm less attentive to that I'm just assuming are are more critical. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tim, you need to unmute there. Yes. Um, thank you for a quite a stimulating um, presentation, actually. Um, interesting. I, um, you know, in so many, many circles and stuff, they talk about predictive programming in, in movies and series, uh, especially the one that are talking about, you know, like science fiction themes or... Uh, or um, you know, edgy type of situations. Um, how much this predictive programming, meaning that they they introduce a subject or they introduce a, a consequences in the movie, and then many years later we find it it happened. You know, that's that's the that's the I think the definition. Mm -hmm. um, how much is it a conscious effort? Some people some people do believe that. It is a conscious effort inserted by um, either, you know, big tech or even uh, intelligence uh, communities versus um, it's just the quite an imaginative mm -hmm. uh, interpretation of the screenwriters or the of the book or 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 that. It's 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 very it's 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 something that uh, it's coming often now that we have all sorts of huge tech. Consequences, yeah. AI, quantum, you know, mass surveillance, control. So, what, what, from your perspective, what uh, what do you think? I think like I'm I'm not familiar with the term predictive programming itself, but now I'm curious to to know more. But from from what you've described, it, it makes me think about the question of of the relationship between being shown something and or sorry i guess i'm rephrasing or just make sure i understand the question properly that we're we are shown something or presented with some sort of technology or innovation on screen and then it is materialized later whether that and the question is whether that is an intentional um sort of inception of sorts not um and while i'm not familiar with that that term or that framing i do think about the ways that um that films and tv uh, I guess the term would be mediate or represent, let's see, are they representing something that must or will happen in the future? Um, I tend to think of it more in the terms of, I, um, 
of them representing something to us that we're experiencing right now in the present. So I, I can't speak in as to the really the sort of inception sort of model of something being put out there for us and then that materializes later. Um, but I I would say that I think that the new technologies that are imagined in film, certainly they might appear a few days, a few years down the line, but it also could be that they say something about what culture producers and writers feel like the present moment is. So even if they might be speculating about what's going to happen in the future, the thing that they're showing us is because of a current concern they have. So in the film, The Circle, um, and in the book, The Circle, the creators are imagining that there's going to be maybe this sort of total surveillance of um, of people having cameras everywhere and everything being seen. Um, but what that's doing is registering just a present anxiety that they have of this sense that we might be on that trajectory. Or in the case of, um, if anyone's familiar with William Gibson's novel, Neuromancer, um, we read that in my class this week. And there's this funny bit where like, um, on the one hand, that author was talking about how like he there he said in a foreword that there are clearly some things about the future that he didn't predict well. Like there's a part where the artificial intelligence calls him on a bank of payphones. And I don't know when the last time is that I've seen a bank of payphones somewhere. Um, but he does describe there an artificial intelligence that whose ways of thinking are not comprehensible to human beings or are very difficult for it to explain. The artificial intelligence has a lot of trouble translating what it is thinking and what it means to represent it in front of people. Um, and some parts of that premise are similar to the relative opacity of uh, our ability or even engineers' ability to describe what exactly generative AI is doing in, in terms of like its decision-making trees and processes through neural nets and things. And in that case, I don't think that William Gibson knew that that would be um, uh, the way that artificial intelligence would take form today, but it does register something that was of a particular concern for him at the time is would artificial intelligence reach a point where we just simply cannot understand it. Um, and that as a human concern has clearly, I think, persisted over the decades to something that we're still dealing with now. So does that help answer your question to, to some extent or respond? Yeah, yeah, it also would be interesting for you to check this 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 term uh, yeah i made a note to, to check yeah it out. It, it's it's quite um prevalent um uh, you know we see a lot of people go back and get clips and say yeah. see oh my god you know exactly what happened and you know mm -hmm. and all of that it's um it's it's like in one of those uh, series uh they were talking about you know uh, a pandemic and a virus and, oh yeah and 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 it, it almost exactly the same thing happened, and how we reacted to the COVID, for example. Yeah. It, almost, you know, you know, in, in exact terms, and you know, people are saying, well, you know, did they know or they or not? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. the the science fiction novel that I think of like that um, is there's a book by Ling Ma called Severance, and there were a few. So I think Severance and Station Eleven were two novels that people talked about as COVID really got going because they had just come out a few years prior. Um, and in Severance, there's a scene where like the, the 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 outbreak has started to happen. Everyone's gathered together in the in the office and they say like, you know, here are your masks issued by the company. Here are the rules from HR of you know what you should do when um or how to protect yourself. Um, and it felt very similar to the ways that we dealt with or companies were trying to struggle with the COVID pandemic when it actually came out. Um, and in a case like that, I think of it as, you know, less a matter of her predicting exactly what would happen as much as her um, being the author, being very familiar with how is it that companies, how do the public respond to a sort of public health crisis like this? How would they? Um, and and that is, was turned out to be, um, in 2020 as consistent as it was as she imagined it in 2016 or 17. Um, and so I feel like um, some of those things are things that um, are the the author or the culture creator, I think like accurately representing how we respond to certain sorts of situations and then the situation arises and, and their guess on that response is accurate. Thank you. Okay, I had a question, and 
That is that these are like the sword of Damocles. All of these technological innovations, including the blurring of the line between civilian corporate life and uh, the military industrial complex. For instance, I go to a very high scale uh, alumni lunch group mm -hmm. once a month. And we had uh, Professor Wolfgang Fink, who is involved with all kinds of uh, animated beings that, you know, working on simulations of parts of the body, like the mm -hmm. eyes and uh, regenerating eyes through the neuro and electro, electro engineering to simulate and stimulate the optic nerve. Well, he was talking all in positives and he introduced that giant dog that uh, Boston Dynamics had created. Mm -hmm. Is it Boston or General Dynamics? I don't know, but you know, the big hound. And I remembered Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451, in the 1960s, where there was this being, an electric being called the mechanical hound that the very mm -hmm. repressive government had that had uh, claws that had uh, morphine in them and could kill people with injecting them with morphine or it could just knock them out. And that thing would be bounding across the landscape. And it looked very similar to this mechanical hound that he was presenting only in a positive light, mm -hmm. only, oh, how nice that they're doing this. And I thought, this is this is the way people come to think. They drop the other uses of their technology. And when they're in a campus or when they're in a very enclosed island universe, a discursive uh, community where everyone thinks only of the positive, mm -hmm. it makes it very difficult for there to be an agora, like Aristotle said, where everything that affects the polis should be open for discussion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I really got it a big time. It, it made me very jangled when I came out of that meeting with Wolfgang Fink saying, oh, this is wonderful. Look at this big dog. So can you, can you address this blurring between corporate life and military industrial life, and also the encapsulated kind of island universe discourse, mm -hmm. discourse community that they form. Yeah, I, I mean, I without knowing more, like I don't know as much historically about the the military industrial complex and those relations, ex except that as we were chatting about before it kicked mm -hmm. off. In a way, I kind of live it because. Um, you know, Penn State is here, Raytheon is here, um, Penn State's Advanced Applied Research Laboratories, which is, um, I think, a good amount of defense contracting is here. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, there's, you know, probably something of a bubble within those large corporations, but it's also um, a fluid uh, social interaction in, in a way, too, because at least within our um, community, people work there, people work for the university, Um and so in, in my context, at least, it's a, it's a little bit more intermingled. Um, but what I would be able to talk about more is the, the relationship between um, when you mentioned the the dog from uh, the dog, the mechanical dog yeah. in the story and the one in the present, there is, I think, a funny relationship between science fictional elements that appear in culture and the ways that those are. Um, and, and in your case, it sounds like it wasn't a purposeful um, reference back to there, but sometimes there are purposeful reference back to science fiction um, in companies in ways that seem surprisingly um, purposefully or not unaware of what sometimes a very critical context surrounding those things. Um, so for instance, there is um, the company Palantir that's I think involved in a large amount of big data and surveillance and a large contract, I think, to the government. Um, the term Palantir comes back to the Lord of the Rings. These uh, were the Palantirs, the crystal globe used to, I think, communicate across large distances, but whoever can see one can also be seen. And if you're familiar with the film or the story, at one point a hobbit grabs one and is almost driven mad by what he sees. Um, and that I assume, or at least I'd like to assume, that that negative connotation wasn't really in their minds when they chose the name of the company. Or in the case of Ready Player One, um, I think Microsoft... Um, I think even circulated that book uh, internally because of, I guess, enthusiasm within the company. And I think also with some interest in virtual reality or things like that. But And the author was even very enthusiastic about that in a news article that I read. And yet at the same time, that book is still sort of critical about, you know, should we all live, live online in this way? And that sort of critical aspect sort of gets lost in the rush to 
touch onto a cultural touchstone. So I do think that there's this funny relationship between what um, the the position of some sort of neat innovation within a novel and what is actually trying to say, like in the case of a dog, versus the ways that it might sometimes later be manifest in um, in the real world or how people might pick up on it. Well, uh, that dog is a model for an autonomous uh, military unit. Okay. Yeah. You know, it is not a civilian. Pro it, it's being yeah. developed, but this company has very, you know, close ties with the military yeah. and contracts. So, so this big dog might be, it might be a secondary. It, it might not be a soldier. It might not act like the mechanical hound and. Fahrenheit 51, but it would be carrying things or it would go into a bomb area and sniff mm -hmm. out, you know. So um, it, it was a very frightening thing to see the hound in actuality that it mm -hmm. could be equipped to have not morphine, but something that it would, you know, yeah. like the gas or something it could shoot at people. I don't know. Or yeah. laser. It, it fun, it's funny when you mentioned that it did also remind me of there's a dog robotic dog character in the cyberpunk novel snow crash by neil stevenson but that dog is a very good boy he's a very nice oh, dog okay. so, <laughs> i'm glad to hear it <laughs> yeah so there's at least one good 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 robot mechanical dog out there in fiction at least but isn't that the case i mean i i, I don't want to take up all the question time but but that these things, whatever is coming in, has a use that's the legitimate use, and then the not only the negative use by an official military industrial complex, but when it's pirated and then some bad actors get hold of it that are rogue to everybody, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's the I think that'll always be the case. And and um and and there are some technologies where I, I'm trying to think because I feel like this example might have come up in class recently, but I forgot. Where it was, but you know, with any technology, there's there's also the question of like a good actor or a bad actor. But there's also the question of you know, should this exist in the first place? Um, in some ways, um, sorry, a good example escapes me at the moment, but um, that's okay. I mean, what you're bringing up that principle of should this exist in the first place? In one of the groups I'm in, they're having very uh, animated discussions of AI. Yeah. You know, and one of the women is tracking laws that are coming in in Congress to mm -hmm. limit experimentation even on this, you know, and what do you, where do you feel that, where, where's your equilibrium? Should we limit even the ability to look into things or that could save the planet if used in the right way? You never know. I think my, my position is a little bit fatalistic in the sense of um, it seems unlikely that that regulation would keep up with um with companies that are so strongly incentivized to push us as, as hard and as as far as they can um yeah so and and it's it seems like we're at a point where it's difficult to it's difficult to see what what the ultimate outcome is going to be like what is the bottom <laughs> that we'll end up with yeah, with China right. AI? It, it might be like five to 10 years before we really know. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, is it too late to do anything about it at that point? So some regulatory provisions probably make sense. Um, but it, uh, I guess my outlook isn't too positive. I'm not sure. It's, it's really strange because whatever we pass in our Congress doesn't affect any other country. I mean, the woman who's doing this is very keen on us limiting but outside of our little magic yeah. bubble here in the U.S., other countries aren't bound by that. Yeah, and there's some back and forth. Like the the, I think that the EU is among the more strictly reg more, is more tends to be more strict with regulation than the United States is, and that has, I think, some repercussions in that if the company has to do something to accommodate them, at least, well, that's like one part of the map, or they might have to accommodate them in a way that. Um, uh, just affects all of their products. And and so I think, for instance, yeah, um, I think the EU mandated that USB-C cables be made like universal or something like that across devices. And so ultimately Apple did that with the iPhone, either for that particular reason or just because it made sense with the rest of the products. So there's some, there's some influence that's possible across different, um, in, in how companies respond to things that happen across different regulatory reasons. Though with the with AI in its direction, I'm I, I don't I confess I don't have a good sense of what's going to be the most impactful way to deal with it. Um, 
except for just having not a great feeling because the incentives are so high for the companies to push as hard and as quickly as they can. Well, do McGregor or anybody have something to say? I, I see McGregor nodding, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we have plenty of discussions on, no, in this. I, wanted, I do want to say something. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have always loved the, the relationship between science fiction, and it's an important thing to watch. So I want to thank you. I need to say goodbye. I need to have another appointment. But thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye, McGregor. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're – oh, go ahead, Carrie. Um, I'll make a comment. Well, I I did also enjoy the presentation very interesting and thought provoking. And I, I like the way that you talked about how the visual representation in the movies and TV represents everybody's underlying fear of, you know, how things are going. And I think that's like, that's just so common, right? That every single movie, I mean, I just thought of all the sci-fi that I watch on TV or see in the movies or and it's less so in reading, I think, because, well, no, probably modern reading, too. That It's just like everyone's sort of worried about it, you know. it's There's never any real positive outcome in any of these things. And, you know, I was kind of comparing it to, like, the old-fashioned kind of crime shows and everything, where it sort of gets at your underlying fear, right, of murder or whatever crime is against people but here it's like against the crime is is so amorphous and so large and i think that like that was a really interesting point that you made about how that's represented in film mm -hmm. so and it's not really a question but just yeah well thank you i appreciate that yeah and that's something where like that i mean uh as as someone who's my background is primarily in english where we do a lot of like reading things very closely. And and as I had the chance to do more work with film in my graduate program, that was what I was trying to bring to like looking at stuff. Like, well, what happens when we like look at films very closely, just in terms of what's on the, the screen. And there are other people who've written important things about that and stuff that I'm uh, obviously um, building on. But yeah, and that, it is hard because I feel like um, in, I think literary academia, there is also the tendency to like be I think the term is like suspicious reading, you know, what is the, what is the ideology or the, you know, dark message underneath everything. And it's hard to sort of fight that tendency. Um, but at the same time, there is, I think a lot of ominous um, undertones or overtones in a lot of his work. And, but I do think it is important to try to find, you know, hopeful stories and images and things that can aspire us to do better, even if, um, you know, even if it doesn't look like that's so promising you know, right now, I'd like to think right. of it. Oh, I have a, I have an injection. Is that it? Interjection. Oh, don't want to inject anyone. But, <laughs> uh, but at ASU, our neighboring city over here uh, in Phoenix, they have a, a whole section in their Center for Creative Innovation, I think it's called, but you can look it up. It's a uh, peaceful science fiction and, and a more less dystopic science fiction. There's a couple professors that are in on it and they're grad students. So that they, they're aware of this overwhelming dystopian yeah. focus that's being constantly thrown out there. And they're trying to come up with less militarized solutions and a more peaceful. So I haven't had a chance to interact with those folks very much, but I, I'd like to get one of them to come and speak as well. That sounds like that would be great. I'll look up more about them because I think I might have heard about that group or or another one at ASU because I was trying to look up the term applied science fiction as like the idea for like an imagined course and the same idea that like when mm -hmm. we think of applied research, it usually comes to like military application or something like that. But, you know, right. can we think about science fiction in an applied way? Um, and I think when I was searching for that, something at ASU came up. So that would be interesting to check out. Okay. The center is called the Center for Creative Innovation, but okay. something very similar to that. Yeah. Any other comments? Or we, we were just so thrilled. This was an excellent presentation, and it gives us a, a kind of like when you get a diagnostic test, now we have a kind of baseline to think about these kinds of issues about the, how 
corporate media has created its wonderful self and thrown it out there with very, you know, varying responses now coming back. Uh, you know, our whole coming out of rhetoric, our whole reality, as S.I. Hayakawa said in Language in Action in 1940, is half created by rhetorical abstractions that we will never see, hear, smell, or taste. Mm -hmm. And people get thrown into wars because of these things. So it's very important how things are represented, what level of abstractions, and, uh, and I do recommend that book. <laughs> it's okay, like yeah, I, language I, in action. I took note of it when I heard you mention yeah. it because at Penn, Penn State is even though I'm not a rhetorician myself, but rhetoric mm -hmm. is a, a big part of our program in the first year writing and stuff. So my my ears perked up when you mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it takes into account this half creating reality through rhetoric. So, uh, any other observations, final comments, or kudos to the speaker, or anything? Who hasn't said anything? There's a couple of you, but you don't have to. <laughs> my husband and my son are curiously silent here. <laughs> She's saying hi to Bob. <laughs> oh, no, you're waving no. your hand to speak. No, I'm just <laughs> saying I, but I have to go. And oh, okay. Thank you okay. so much. Thank I'm you. Thank you all so much for having me. Thanks very much to to Gloria for reaching out. Um, it was really nice to be able to have the opportunity to, to meet all of you and see and listen to people who are thinking about science fiction so deeply and, and in this very engaged way and, and you know, engage, we, engage with the world around us as it is. Um, it's really exciting. We we do have people come back as we've had Tos Tosi Abengija come back a couple times. He's an electron, electrical engineer. And maybe a couple years down the road, it, when things, as you say, you can't foresee what's happening, but couple of years later, maybe we could have you come back and you could say, oh, I couldn't see that then, but now remember my old talk I gave you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I wish you all a very good weekend and I'll be seeing some of you at a luncheon or dinner tonight. So <laughs> thanks very much. Have a good weekend. Bye -bye. Thanks. Have, a, have a good one. Nice to see you, Tim, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Carrie. Nice to see you. Bye-bye, you too. Thanks, Gloria. Thanks You're for welcome. doing this. Very, oh, very welcome. And yeah. Margaret. Very interesting. Okay, bye-bye. See you later, alligators.